The deeds of surface warriors have helped keep this country free from the War of Independence to the War on Terrorism. History is replete with the stories of their contributions, which have enabled surface naval forces to effectively defend the cause of freedom. Each year, the Surface Navy Association honors some of the individuals who have made an exceptionally significant contribution to the Continental Navy, U.S. Surface Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, or to surface Navy warfare as a member of the armed forces or as a civilian. SNA is proud to introduce the following individuals as our newest inductees in the Surface Warfare Hall of Fame. June 1942, New London, Connecticut. Amid World War II, Dorothy C. Stratton takes leave from her duties as Dean of Women at Purdue University. She joins the Women's Reserve of the U.S. Naval Reserve, better known as WAVES, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. The United States Coast Guard Women Reserves is established by Congress and signed into law by President Franklin D. Roosevelt on November 23, 1942. Stratton is appointed director the following day, along with her promotion to lieutenant commander. She is later promoted to captain. Stratton is credited with coining the nickname SPARS for the Women's Reserve. The name is derived from the Coast Guard's motto, Semper Paratus, and its English translation, Always Ready. The literal term is a supporting pole used on sailing ships, which fits the spirit of women in the reserves. Under Stratton's leadership, over 10,000 enlisted women and 1,000 officers serve in SPARS, and the Coast Guard achieves the highest ratio of women to men in any of the armed services at the time. About one of every 15 enlisted personnel and one of every 12 officers were women. The National Security Coast Guard Cutter Stratton is named in her honor. The Sea Services Leadership Association also established an award for female officers in honor of Captain Dorothy Stratton. June 1882, New York City. At age 24, Theodore Roosevelt publishes his first book, The Naval War of 1812. It covers technologies and battles of the war. This book, as well as Roosevelt himself, has a massive impact on the formation of the modern American Navy. After several political and business endeavors, Roosevelt is appointed as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Following the sinking of the battleship Maine in 1898, he serves as Acting Secretary when he instructs Commodore George Dewey to mobilize the Navy for war with Spain. When the Spanish-American War breaks out, Roosevelt leaves Washington and commands the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, better known as the Rough Riders. After leading an invasion near Santiago, Cuba, they return to the States as heroes. For this action, Roosevelt is posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. In September 1901, he is sworn in as president after the assassination of William McKinley. Believing in its critical role to our nation, President Roosevelt strives to transform the Navy into a highly capable force that will turn the United States into a great power. The battleships built under his leadership are larger, faster, better armed, and always maintained on a near-war footing. His influence culminates with the crews of the Great White Fleet, which includes 16 modern battleships of the Atlantic Fleet that sail around the world between December 1907 and February 1909. This exposition sends a clear signal that our nation has a global reach and an ambitious foreign policy. President Roosevelt is credited as being the most influential leader in the creation of the modern U.S. Navy. Numerous monuments and establishments are named in his honor, as well as a submarine and aircraft carrier. February 3, 1943, North Atlantic. The troop ship SS Dorchester is torpedoed by a German U-boat during a convoy to Greenland. Ship's cook second class, Forrest O. Rednor, a U.S. Coast Guardsman aboard the cutter Escanaba, risks his life to rescue survivors from the black and icy waters despite the possibility of enemy submarine attacks. 
Rednor puts himself at great risk of being struck by a propeller or crushed between life rafts and the ship's side as the Escanaba maneuvers back and forth during the rescue. He swims under the counter of his ship and prevents many floating survivors from being caught in the suction of the screws. In one instance, he retrieves a raft. He worked the longest of all the retrievers and accounted for the greatest number of survivors. The Escanaba sinks later that year with Rednauer aboard. For his gallant and voluntary action in subjecting himself to pounding seas and bitter cold for nearly four hours, he contributes to the rescue of 145 people. Petty Officer Rednar is posthumously awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. A high-speed transport and a Coast Guard Award for Excellence in Food Service is named in his honor. May 26, 2006, the North Arabian Gulf. Senior Chief Hospital Corpsman Doreen Lanier prepares her medical team to care for impending mass casualties from a major fire on an Iraqi oil terminal. After providing assistance to the damage control team, she is directed to leave as a major explosion is anticipated. On her way out, a man down call catches her attention. Braving the rising inferno, she and her team place themselves in imminent danger to aid and resuscitate an injured Iraqi worker. She provides urgent life-saving care in the face of imminent explosions and promptly supervises his evacuation past raging 50-foot flames, sagging steel beams, and billowing smoke. By her heroic and prompt actions in the face of great personal risk, Senior Chief Lanier prevents the loss of life by risking her own. In reflecting great credit upon herself and upholding the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service, she is awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. December 11, 1966, Mekong River, Vietnam. Assigned to River Patrol Section 531, Signalman First Class Chester B. Smith serves as patrol officer on a PBR combat patrol. He pursues a sampan into a narrow canal when the three Viet Cong aboard the vessel, along with eight others along the bank, open fire on his patrol boat. He directs his crew to return fire, which suppresses the attack, and then brings in his cover boat from the main river. As his patrol re-enters the canal, he engages a company-sized Viet Cong force which is preparing to board 40 sampans. The enemy opens fire on the patrol boats but are completely repelled and demoralized by his sudden attack, causing them to retreat in confusion. He continues returning heavy fire, destroying their water transport and equipment. After rearming, he directs his machine gunners in silencing six enemy weapons positions and orders a helicopter rocket attack, which destroys an enemy ammunition cache. For his daringly aggressive actions, outstanding initiative, extraordinary courage, and gallant leadership, Petty Officer Smith was awarded the Navy Cross. He later went on and became a warrant officer before receiving his first commission. He retired as a captain in 1993. June 1955, Annapolis, Maryland. Henry Muston graduates from the United States Naval Academy as a fifth generation naval officer, a legacy that started in the 1800s and continues through his influential career as a surface warfare officer. He serves in Vietnam with Delta River Patrol Group and commands the minesweeper Bunting, destroyer Henry B. Wilson, destroyer Squadron 12, cruiser destroyer Group 2, and Second Fleet. Nicknamed Hammer and Hank for his tactical brilliance and uncompromising leadership style, he develops aggressive forward-leaning concepts that puts teeth into the maritime strategy under the orders of then Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, during the height of the Cold War. Mustin devises the fjord tactic, operating carrier strike forces in the Norwegian fjords where, undetected and protected from long-range air attacks, our ships are positioned to strike the Soviets. This creates a conundrum for Soviet planners and changes the calculus as well as the costs of any envisioned aggression by the Soviets in Europe. He stresses detailed pre-planning of potential enemy encounters and says no commander should take the first shot. 
He shows the fleet that the decision timeline is played in seconds, not minutes, hours, or days, and that there is no substitute for tactical preparation and combat readiness. With his astute understanding of combat strategies and introduction of the requirement for distributed strike capability, Mustin makes pioneering contributions to the development of the high-low mix Navy weapon systems, including Tomahawk and standard missiles, Lamps helicopters, frigates, and Aegis-equipped cruisers and destroyers. He believes a well-trained ship aggressively led would always win the day. After 34 years of service, he retires at the rank of Vice Admiral. The destroyer Mustin is named for his family's remarkable legacy of service to the United States Navy and our country. Courage, vision, commitment to mission. Common traits among uncommon individuals who have earned history's respect and who honor us all by their distinction as surface Navy warriors. SNA is proud to add these six outstanding individuals to the already 131 members of the Surface Navy Warfare Hall of Fame.